Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamansing. Tonight, the fight over compensation for Indigenous children drags on. It's frustrating. Ottawa appeals in order to pay while it tries to reach a settlement, with 50,000 kids left waiting. It isn't the position that we want to be in, but we're doing something that we think is right. Where this leaves reconciliation. Do you need a COVID booster? Vaccine effectiveness against infection may decrease over time in some situations. Whether you should get a third shot may depend on where you live. The scandal rocking the NHL. Are they rewarding him for keeping his mouth shut? No penalty for a former Blackhawks executive who stayed silent about a sexual assault allegation. You have to be able to do things you hate. You hate. A controversial new take on Diana. This is definitely not a, a movie that, that she would have signed off or agreed with. Is the portrayal cruel or make her more relatable? This is The National. For years, the federal government has been fighting against a ruling that ordered compensation for Indigenous children who were placed in the child welfare system. Today, it had the option of continuing that fight or work out a settlement, and it chose to pursue both. Its latest appeal was filed, then paused as everyone heads to the negotiating table. In the meantime, as Olivia Stefanovic explains, frustration continues to build among those caught in the middle. Tessa Kwachikin's first memory is being pulled away from her mom at the age of two. I can still feel that car seat coming down sometimes and the felt that was on it, you know. Years later, her own son was also taken into child welfare, then eventually returned after Kwachikin battled child and family services. It's frustrating. It's really frustrating. And why, she says, the ongoing legal fight around compensating Indigenous children is personal. When they start to recognize what these effects have and like the empowerment they could give so much youth, once they understand that, they can really make this nation a different place. The federal government is temporarily pausing litigation to negotiate compensation. We're going to work like hell during the next 60 days. If no deal is reached, it's back to court. This has the potential to be, to be messy, but messy is good. That would resume an appeal. Ottawa filed against a federal court ruling upholding a landmark Canadian Human Rights Tribunal order. It isn't the position that we want to be in, um, and certainly it doesn't help with reconciliation, but we're doing something that we think is right. The tribunal found the government discriminated against First Nations children by underfunding the on-reserve child welfare system, ordering the government to pay $40,000 to each child who went through the system from at least 2006, along with their parent or grandparent. This is a really sad day and it's going to have significant impact on the ability of Indigenous people to work with this government. Ottawa doesn't like the tribunal's one-size-fits-all compensation plan and wants to set up one system to also cover people not included in this case. I want to see if it's a real serious offer to end the discrimination. Cindy Blackstock will be negotiating at the table. She filed the original human rights complaint 14 years ago. If not, we'll go to the courtrooms again, because that's where we've been successful. So, Olivia, when will negotiations start? Well, Ian, talks begin Monday and are expected to continue until sometime in December. The stakes are high. Tens of thousands of people could be eligible for compensation, leaving the government on the hook for billions of dollars. Crown Indigenous Relations Minister Mark Miller says some people could end up receiving more than the $40,000 set out by the tribunal. And if negotiations fail... Blackstock says she's prepared to head all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada. Thanks, Olivia. An Indigenous man recovering from COVID is speaking out tonight. He is one of about two dozen patients in Saskatchewan who have been transferred out of province as ICUs became overwhelmed. As Bonnie Allen tells us, he's getting the care he needs, but he says it's coming at a painful cost. The way they treated me... <coughs> Saskatoon, they just came there and said, you're leaving to Ottawa. 66-year-old Ken Roth, a retired fire chief from northern Saskatchewan, is one of at least 22 intensive care patients who have been moved out of province to Ontario. I said, no, you can't do that. My family's here. I can't just go. 
The Métis man says his wife and daughter had been visiting him at the Saskatoon hospital every day, but he was moved so quickly he didn't even have time for a phone call to say goodbye. A traumatic reminder, he says, of how he was ripped away from his mother when he was six and sent to residential school. I'm sorry. And just like when I was a kid, they did the same thing. It just hurt me so much. Another six ICU patients will be moved to Ontario by Sunday for a total of 28. The head of the Saskatchewan Health Authority says there's a process to inform patients who are conscious and their families. Certainly would apologize for the, you know, any pain or, and or suffering uh, for that patient that would not coincide with uh, our current uh, process of uh, having people sent out of province. The province isn't sure whether it will move more patients next week. We are seeing a reduction in our, our COVID patients. Uh, we are seeing a reduction in, a, in the use of ICU beds. But if it does, Roth says to be more sensitive, especially to residential school survivors. Let them at least talk to their family. It really brought trauma back to me. Roth is pleased with the care he's receiving at Ottawa Hospital. His family is driving to Ontario, but most are not fully vaccinated and won't be able to visit him in hospital. A policy Saskatchewan will soon adopt as well. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Meadow Lake, Saskatchewan. For survivors and their families, the National Residential School Crisis Line is available. If you need help, you can call 24 hours a day. Ottawa has announced new guidelines for who should get COVID vaccine booster shots. Currently, the age requirement varies widely across the country. Christine Birak looks at what may change with these new recommendations. It's official. NACI, Canada's advisory committee on vaccines, now says people over 80 should get a booster shot. And others may be offered one too if they've been fully vaccinated for over six months including those in their 70s, anyone fully vaccinated with AstraZeneca, adults from Indigenous communities, and some frontline healthcare workers. Really, this third dose is to strengthen the protection. But they're just recommendations. Provinces ultimately decide who can get a booster and when. In Alberta, the Northwest Territories, BC and New Brunswick, shots are already approved for some of those groups and beyond. Ontario says it'll expand eligibility next week, but it won't likely go as far. I think they're going to align with NACI uh, for for the time being, you know, there's no need to do the general population yet. Canada's chief public health officer agrees. Right now, the vaccines are still performing really well against um, severe outcomes and for the most of the population. That's exactly what the latest data shows. So far, 95% of people hospitalized with COVID-19 and roughly 93% of deaths have occurred in people who were not fully vaccinated. As for why boosters are being offered at all? I think it's kind of like a better safe than sorry. It's better to give a booster a little bit earlier rather than wait till it's too late. Studies show different arms of the immune system are protecting people against severe disease for at least six months after an mRNA vaccine. Other preliminary data is showing eight months. But what boosters are going to do is they're going to prevent or reduce the chances that you'll even get infected. Which has some questioning whether the goalpost for being fully vaccinated could eventually shift to three doses instead of two. Dr. Teresa Tam says while there's nothing in the works, it has been discussed. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Well, for some analysis, let's bring in Dr. Samir Sinha, the Director of Geriatrics at Mount Sinai Hospital in Toronto. And Dr. Sinha, how do you feel about the NACI recommendations? Yeah, I'm thrilled with NACI's recommendation today. It really has been following the science throughout the pandemic. And what it shows that in Canada, in our specific circumstance, this is the right time to start giving booster shots to older adults and other high-risk populations. So NACI's been following the science, and this is the right time to make this next move. You know, one of the things I wondered about when I saw those recommendations is that for people who have had two doses of AstraZeneca or one dose of the Janssen vaccine, they're eligible for a booster shot. What does that say about those vaccines? 
those vaccines are excellent vaccines. And right, the people who aren't vaccinated are the ones who are actually having most of the troubles. What we do know now is that an mRNA vaccine mixed with those regular vaccines gives them as well extra special protection. So this is why this is actually a good recommendation to follow because it's grounded in the science. We have just about 15 seconds left for the people who aren't in those groups announced today. When can they expect boosters? I think like BC, they're saying probably in the new year, and I think that's probably coming. But again, we want to wait till we have the science to say that's a good move for all of us. Dr. Sinha, thank you. Thanks for having me. In the U.S., the FDA has approved the Pfizer COVID vaccine for children between the ages of 5 and 11. Vaccinating younger children against COVID-19 will bring us closer to returning to a sense of normalcy. The FDA advisory panel voted overwhelmingly for the move, but there is one more step. The CDC will hear more detailed recommendations next week and make its final decision soon afterwards. In Canada, the decision may take longer. I don't have a crystal ball, but it's looking, again, sort of mid to the end of November as, a, as an estimate. Health Canada's chief medical advisor says the review is going well, but the agency is looking at the data before moving forward. Only a small number of countries, including China, have approved vaccines for children under 12. And later we'll hear from parents who enrolled their kids in both the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine trials. It worked well with us. We knew it worked well across the country and everybody else who's taking it. So I was very confident that the trial was going to go smoothly with my daughters. Three parents share their message for the vaccine hesitant. That's coming up in about 20 minutes. Turning now to the sexual misconduct scandal that has shaken the hockey world. This week's damning revelations have already cost several former Chicago Blackhawk leaders their current jobs, but not the man who now runs the Winnipeg Jets. Cameron McIntosh tells us why he was cleared today and what people think about that. As the 2010 Chicago Blackhawks celebrated winning the Stanley Cup on the ice, a decade-long off-ice scandal was just starting. A cover-up of a sexual assault complaint made by then-player Kyle Beach against video coach Brad Aldrich as the Hawks focused on winning the Cup. Then assistant general manager Kevin Sheveldayoff, now Winnipeg Jets GM, was one of a handful of team managers who knew of the complaint, but now is the only one absolved, surprising many hockey fans looking for accountability. Wow, that's surprising. Huh. Well, I think there may be some backlash. You can make two cases for it, right? We don't know. And yes, they're keeping the boys club going or that's the proper analysis. After meeting in New York, NHL Commissioner Gary Bettman said Sheveldayoff was not in senior leadership and couldn't be assigned responsibility for the team's actions or inactions. In a statement, Shovel Dayoff praised Beach. We can all use his courage as an inspiration to make hockey a safer space for anyone that wants to play the game. Beach says he's speaking out for change. The truth has come out that the people in the appropriate positions will take action. So far, action amid growing anger has been resignations of the Blackhawks general manager and former coach. There's a move to take Aldrich's name off the Stanley Cup. But real accountability goes much further, says this expert in athlete abuse. It's, it's too, too late in the process. We should be asking the questions, you know, how do we ensure that these things never happen again? Victims advocate Sheldon Kennedy says for Shovel Dayoff and other NHL leaders, that means taking the fear of reprisal out of speaking out. And I think if they can show that and be genuine about it, then, you know, there might be room in the league for them. The NHL has a league-wide system for reporting abuse. The tests say advocates is making people feel safe enough to use it. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. Canada's Supreme Court considered a question today that is often left to personal taste. How far is too far when it comes to comedy? It ruled in favour of a comedian's right to free speech in jokes making fun of a disabled teen. Jayla Bernstein explains. Disappointed but determined despite losing his case. One of my mission will be to, to, to inspire people to be themselves. Now in his 20s, Jeremy Gabriel's legal battle dates back to his childhood. His dream was to perform, and though he was born deaf with Treacher Collins syndrome, a surgery made it possible for Gabriel to hear and sing. He skyrocketed to fame and even sang for the Pope. 
Then in 2010, comedian Mike Ward performed this stand-up bit. He poked fun at Quebec's untouchables, celebrities generally not laughed at. Ward joked about the way Gabriel sang, how he looked, and said he once tried to kill him. Gabriel and his mother went to the courts. They complained that kids at school were bullying him and that the comments were discriminatory. The Quebec Human Rights Tribunal agreed, but Ward challenged it all the way to the Supreme Court and won. I think it's a victory for Mike Ward, certainly, but also for liberty across the country. In a split ruling, the Supreme Court says Ward's comments may have been repugnant, but that alone isn't enough. The judges say the jokes exploited, rightly or wrongly, a feeling of discomfort in order to entertain, but they did little more than that. And so they don't meet the bar for discrimination. I do not think Mike Ward went too far in that joke. This comedian is a friend and longtime colleague of Mike Ward. I will acknowledge that it's unfortunate that a child was injured uh, by it. As for Gabriel and what he'd like to say to Ward? I would want to tell him if, if today <laughs> I weren't here to talk about it because I would have took my own life, how, how would he feel? How would, how would, would, would he react? Would he talk about freedom of speech? Ward says he's relieved, but not happy. He says he wishes Gabrielle success and the best in life. Jayla Bernstein, CBC News, Montreal. The conduct of a Canadian actor is now being investigated by a CBC show after he used a racial slur on a movie set. Eli Glasner spoke with a crew member who says he was the target. Yo, hi, it's DaVinci here. Hey, what, are you afraid of something? What are you afraid of? You may know Nicholas Campbell from his frequent roles on CBC's Coroner, Da Vinci's Inquest, or numerous films. But Andre Mike discovered a different side of the Canadian actor on the set of a film shooting in Orangeville, Ontario. Mike is a grip technician. We're basically the muscle, uh, the engine behind the entire set. He was working outside on Impasse, a small budget thriller. It was October 17th. Uh, it was a rainy, cold day. As he prepared the scene for Campbell, the conversation turned to the weather. And he just so casually said, you winter N-word uh, are used to this kind of weather. And uh, the DP, he said, what was that? And uh, he's, he repeated, he said, well, you know, you northern N-words are, you know, you're used to this. In an apology shared with CBC News, Campbell acknowledged the slur, saying... It doesn't matter that I was retelling a story or that I was actually quoting someone else's usage of that word. That horrible and divisive word should never come out of my mouth, and it never will again. Campbell says he didn't direct the offensive slur towards Mike or any crew member. There was myself and another black um, man behind him. Right there, he won't be saying it to anybody else. It was definitely towards us. Campbell is now off the CBC series Coroner pending an investigation. He's still working on impasse. In fact, on that Sunday, shooting continued. The producer apologized to Mike for what was said, but it left him shaken. You went home, mm -hmm. you couldn't sleep. Like, couldn't sleep. Really? Yeah, couldn't Why? sleep. It just continued to replay in my head. Uh, you go through something like that, and it's traumatizing. In his statement, Campbell says he needs to change and is willing to get help. For his part, Mike isn't letting what happened discourage him. Black people have come too far to let, you know, these things stop them in, like, you know, from pursuing their dreams. Eli Glasner, CBC News, Toronto. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is in the Netherlands to work with Dutch parliamentarians on fighting online extremism and global climate change. Canada and the Netherlands share a commitment to the brighter tomorrow we want to see. Trudeau says the two allied nations are well positioned to work together thanks to shared progressive values. Tomorrow, the PM will be at the G20 in Rome and later in the weekend at the COP26 Climate Summit in Glasgow, Scotland, where he plans to work with other nations to try to achieve Canada's climate goals. We know that if there is not the investments made in cleaner energy and in new technologies in the global south, we don't hit our targets. In the lead-up to the Climate Summit next week, CBC News is committed to telling stories about our changing planet. Tonight, we look at expectations for Canada's newly appointed Environment Minister as he heads to COP26. Travis Danraj has more.
adults and world leaders aren't taking this crisis seriously and young people have definitely had to really step up and take the action that's needed. Alia Hirji is traveling to Glasgow with an Indigenous-led BIPOC youth group to make sure her generation is heard. At 16, she's already fed up with world leaders making climate promises they fail to deliver on. In past conferences, uh, Canada has been really critical on other nations, which I don't think it has a right to, given how much our emissions have risen. In 2015, Prime Minister Trudeau pledged Canada would reduce its emissions by 30 percent, this year setting a more ambitious target of 40 to 45 percent by 2030. Enter new Environment Minister Stephen Gilbeau, a former Greenpeace activist. We have to go further and we have to do it faster. But the fundamentals that we've put in place at home carbon pricing that is rebated to Canadians, phasing out coal-fired electricity generation, and a clean fuel standard. Those three measures alone, if adopted by the world, would go a long way to meeting the Paris targets. Elizabeth May has attended a dozen COP summits. She's going to Glasgow as part of Canada's delegation, looking for rich nations to take serious action, not just make promises to cut emissions. Why should anyone believe the wealthy polluting countries of this planet anymore when we fail to deliver on any commitment we make. Hirji agrees that in Canada and other G20 nations need to follow through on a promise to raise $100 billion a year to help poorer countries tackle climate change. This is a crisis that's going to affect the entire world and so the entire world really needs to work together to act against it for present generations and future generations. It is, she says, the only way forward for youth around the world. The stakes couldn't be higher. Travis Danrash, CBC News, Ottawa. Queen Elizabeth won't be among those attending the summit, cancelling her appearance following a night in hospital last week. And now there's word her unscheduled break may be longer than originally expected. Buckingham Palace says doctors have advised at least two more weeks of rest for the 95-year-old. That means no official appearances for the Queen during that time, but she could undertake some light duties, including virtual meetings. With the U.S. land border about to reopen, a lot of Canadians are planning to head south. We just imagine it's going to be really crazy at the border. First time in a helicopter, right? Next, the lengths some snowbirds are going to beat the rush. The Canadian fighting climate change in Iceland in the presidential residence. We're not going to deal with the climate crisis unless we make conscious decisions to deal with the climate crisis. Mommy, what happened to make you so sad? And a new portrayal of the people's princess. This is definitely not a, a movie that, that she would have signed off or agreed with. Kristen Stewart on her interpretation of Diana. We're back in two. A scary sight for some PEI parents. A school bus carrying students flipped on its side. Officials say three children were sent to hospital. All are said to be in stable condition. However, one was airlifted to hospital in Halifax. No word yet on the cause of the accident. Thousands of public service workers walked off the job in New Brunswick this morning. That forced schools to close unexpectedly. The strike coming after talks broke down with the province this week over wage increases. Community colleges, transportation and some health care services were also affected. The province is calling the job action completely unnecessary. I fully support collective bargaining, but unions have a choice in the way that they manage these processes. And they made a choice this morning, and I don't think it's a choice that's defensible for our school system or for our province. Students have been told they'll be learning from home starting Monday and should expect to do so until the strike has ended. The federal government announced today the window for traveling while unvaccinated in Canada is about to close. Let me be very clear. If you are not fully vaccinated against COVID-19 by the end of November, you will not be allowed to board a plane or train in Canada. That covers both foreign and domestic travel. The policy officially kicks in tomorrow, but there is a month-long grace period where a negative test is sufficient. The longer grace period for fly-in communities and foreign nationals is in place, as well as exemptions for emergencies. 
Of course, in many ways, travel still hasn't recovered after 19 months of pandemic disruption. But Sophia Harris has one great Canadian migration set to make a real comeback. Diane and David Fine were stuck at home in Ontario last winter due to the pandemic. But this year, their annual migration to Arizona is back on. Since we're vaccinated, um, we feel a lot safer than we used to. The couple is flying to Buffalo with a company that is also driving their RV to Buffalo. So when the fines land, they can pick it up and head south. First time in a helicopter, right? Eh? First time. You're going to love it. <laughs> the fines could drive into the U.S. on November 8th when the land border reopens to fully vaccinated travelers. But these snowbirds want to beat the rush. We just imagine it's going to be really crazy at the border. Long, long wait times. All the snowbirds are going to be converging at the same time. The Canadian Snowbird Association estimates less than a third of Canada's one million snowbirds traveled south last winter. But it predicts most will go this year. Now that we have the vaccines, now that we have the land border opening up, they're determined to make the trip down south now. You have over 70% of snowbirds that travel with their Canadian vehicles. Snowbird Fred Welsh also stayed home last winter, but this year the Newfoundlander can't wait to drive his RV to Florida. I am ecstatic. I'm over the moon and back again. Welsh is also anticipating long lineups at the border on November 8th, but plans to cross that day anyway. The sooner I get there, the better. I have a great passion for this sunny weather. It's kind of cold here in Newfoundland, and I do not want to spend another winter here in Newfoundland. But it's not all clear skies ahead for snowbirds. COVID-19 infections in the U.S. remain high. And health officials warn that traveling abroad still poses risks. Even so, for many snowbirds, one Canadian winter was enough. We're willing to play it safe and wear our masks and everything else to get the sun. For added protection, the Fines and Welsh plan to get a COVID-19 booster shot in the U.S., something they can't yet get in Canada. Sophia Harris, CBC News, Toronto. As the FDA approves Pfizer's COVID vaccine for kids in the U.S., we want to go beyond the headlines with parents whose kids took part in the trials. There is nothing in this earth I love more than my children. Next, why they decided to enroll their kids and what they want other parents who may be hesitant to know. talked about the reviews um, and that they are guided by science and evidence and we need to really be sure that we're taking the time to go through all of that. As we mentioned earlier in the program, Health Canada's chief medical advisor says the approval of the Pfizer vaccine for kids aged 5 to 11 is still a few weeks away. But in the U.S. we could see shots in arms a lot sooner. But some kids have already received a COVID vaccine through a clinical trial, though not here in Canada. Tonight, we wanted to go beyond the headlines with parents in the United States who know this experience firsthand. Emily Solari's three children took part in the Pfizer trial. Brett Hughes's two daughters were in the Moderna trial. And Rebecca Davis's son also in the Moderna trial. Welcome to all three of you. Thank you Thank for you. having me. Thank you for having us. Emily, so this was a trial, and I'll bet a lot of parents watching this are wondering, were you anxious at all about enrolling your kids? We were not. We um, had sort of very closely followed the trial for the adults. Um, we knew that there was dem demonstrated safety and efficacy in the adult with the adult population. And um, we also had some details about the trial that the dosage would be less than what adults received. Um, and we had very clear, clear communication between us and the folks on the research team about what the procedures would be. And we felt really safe um, uh, enrolling in the trial. And Brett, what about you? Any nervousness at all? Very, very little nervousness. I really trusted the science at the time. My wife had the Pfizer vaccine. I had, the vaccine, I had the Moderna vaccine as well. It worked well with us. We knew it worked well across the country and everybody else who's taken it. So I was very confident that the trial was going to go smoothly with my daughters. So you and your wife, Brett, were very confident, but I understand you have some family members who are not vaccinated. What was their view of you enrolling your kids in this trial? It was some shock. <laughs> it was some shock. But... You know, it was one concern that I have with trials in general with uh, with drugs in the U.S. is that my demographic is not really represented a lot. 
And this was a chance. I would have loved to participate in the trial, the adult trial myself, but since I did not have that opportunity, I thought it was great that my daughters had the opportunity and they were really fired up about it because they wanted to help in this pandemic as well. So we were very confident going in and hopefully, I don't know if it changed the minds of people in my family, but hopefully it changed the minds out there. All right, cute video alert. Rebecca, you sent us uh, some video of your son, Will, telling us about why he wanted to be part of the trial, and uh, we're going to play a portion of that right now. I want to make sure other kids can get vaccinated, and also, like, I haven't been able to see my friends in a while, and now, like, I finally can because I got into the trial. So, Rebecca, really impressive kid you have there. T tell us about the conversation you had with him about the trial. Well, um, he has a lot of health anxiety, and I think he was eager to get protection from COVID-19 once his father and I were able to get our shots, and he was find, kind of felt left out. So um, I suggested that he might want to do the trial, and I signed him up, and um, he got in a few months later, and um, it's been a good experience for us. And, and Rebecca, give us a sense, because, uh, you know, all of us who are watching have, or well, most of us anyway, have not gone through something like this. How closely are, are, are your kids monitored uh, through this? Um, they're very closely monitored. Uh, for the duration of the trial, we're supposed to tell them, like, about every tummy ache and every, you know, broken arm or anything that comes up that might not have anything to do with the trial. They want to know it. And um, they uh, had us do, like, e-diaries for, you know... Uh, about a week after both shots and like you know they wanted to know his temperature and they wanted to know does he have this symptom that symptom um i felt like it was pretty thorough and it, it was thorough but not invasive or anything it wasn't like we'd have to go in a bunch of times um they just had us do the e-diary it's pretty easy and, and brett for for adults uh you know lots of different stories about uh, symptoms some people have no symptoms after the shot other people sore arms other people f feel like they have the flu for you know a day or so what about for your kids w what what kind of reaction did they have to the shots my oldest sophia had no side effects whatsoever my youngest sydney she had some headaches but she's kind of prone to headaches as well so we monitor that and they proved to be transient Emily, the big question for people who are watching and those who might be hesitant about uh, giving their kids vaccines once that rolls out across the country, uh, what would you say to them? You know, I would say just following up a little bit on how closely the kids were monitored, you should feel very safe that this was studied closely. My kids actually received their first shot in June and... Um, you know, and they got the Pfizer vaccine, so they will be unblinded next week. So we'll be able to find out which one of them got the vaccine. But they have been monitored this entire time. There have been follow-up appointments. Um, and I've been really impressed with the level of data collection to ensure the safety for, um, for the vaccine. And Rebecca, similar question to you. I mean, this is, this is a big question, right? And, and so, again, what would you say to, to parents watching uh, about getting their kids vaccinated? I feel like it's totally normal and reasonable to have questions or hesitancies or be unsure. And I would just encourage those parents to take those questions up with their doctors and the pediatricians and the medical professionals that they've chosen. Um, because I feel like, you know, that's who you should be getting the medical information from, you know, not from your family or your friends. Like you should go to the experts. And that's what I would, I would just implore everybody thinking they're not sure to go and ask the experts. And Brett, we have about 30 seconds left. You mentioned that your, the, your community, uh, the African-American community has had, you know, uh, lower perhaps uh, rates of vaccination than some other communities. And there are trust issues here in Canada among some people when it comes to vaccines and, and the medical profession. So last word to you, what's your message to those who, who just might not trust the system when it comes to vaccinating kids? There is nothing in this earth I love more than my children. So if I'm comfortable to have my children take this vaccine, they should be comfortable as adults and their children to get the vaccine as well. It works. It works. Trust the science. It works. Well, all three of you are so impressive, and uh, thank you very much for speaking with us here in Canada tonight. Of course. Thank, thank you very much for having us. Next, a conversation with Iceland's first lady, who also happens to be Canadian. I think I was a little bit nervous that there was no job description at the beginning or no, no handbook on how to be a, a first lady. How oh, she's helping to champion solutions to climate change. That's right after the break.
Welcome back. Ahead of next week's climate summit, we want to take you to Iceland. The country's first couple and its Canadian first lady are helping tackle climate change one volcano at a time. Chris Brown explains. Iceland is defined by its Arctic identity and its fabulous natural wonders. And people who, for a thousand years, have embraced their rugged existence with ambition and a sense of fairness. Now Icelanders are hoping those values can help lead the world through the challenges posed by a warming climate. The first people who arrived here, they decided this is a good place in which to live. The sea is close and the sea is full of fish. On a picturesque peninsula near the capital Reykjavik, we visited the official residence of Iceland's president, Gudni Johansson, and the first lady, Eliza Reid, who's a Canadian. There's a seal that sometimes sits over on the rock. Reid is originally from Ottawa. She met Johansson when they were students at Oxford University. A historian, in 2016, he was elected Iceland's head of state. The job is nonpartisan and mostly ceremonial, somewhat like Canada's Governor General. And it thrust Reid into an unexpectedly prominent role in her adopted country. I think I was a little bit nervous that there was no job description at the beginning or no, no handbook on how to be a, a first lady. And then I've just decided I would just do that myself. She learned Icelandic and speaks it fluently. And that's helped her champion prominent causes such as gender equality and Iceland's role in heading off global warming, which was the focus of our conversation. I want to know what you see in terms of a changing environment and, and, yeah. and what your level of concern is. Right. I, I absolutely, you know, anecdotally see a changing environment. You, you know, milder winters with less snow in the capital area, a, a glacier tongue that came right to the ring road, our main highway here, when I first visited Iceland 20 years ago, that you know have to drive five kilometers in to go and see. But there's also wonderfully optimistic examples of work that we're doing to try to improve this. And Iceland is a global leader in terms of renewable energy sources. Much of Iceland sits atop active volcanoes. 85% of the homes here are heated by harnessing geothermal energy from inside the earth including the presidential home. The capital is also full of geothermal baths and outdoor pools. It's clean and affordable power that can be tapped into far beyond Iceland, says the president. All around the world, you can find uh, Icelandic companies trying to develop with, with uh, interested parties uh, geothermal energy. So. This is one of the keys to tackle the climate crisis, not just to, to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels, but also to create cleaner, better cities. That's not to say that Iceland has it all figured out. There are still major challenges here. Though it's home to just 400,000 people, Iceland has among the highest greenhouse gas emissions per capita in Europe. They come from heavy industry, from agriculture, and vehicles. A rapidly growing tourism sector is also adding to the challenge of reducing that emissions footprint. Well, I see COP in Glasgow as a, a sensible step. It's a call to all nations to make sure that we continue moving in the right direction and at, a, at an even uh, increased speed. Iceland just fought an election over whether decarbonizing by the government's 2040 deadline, already a decade faster than most nations, is actually moving too slowly. Its net zero emissions plan includes nurturing companies that capture and sequester CO2, planting a lot more trees and transitioning farmland into wetlands to absorb more carbon, including land next to the presidential estate the water there. Uh, we had ditches there. Those ditches were dug in the 1930s to cultivate the land. Now we are filling up those ditches. It's a case of wetland reclamation. How do you frame the challenge that the world is facing? We can't keep talking. But I think the point is just to say it's like gender equality. Clearly it's not just happening of its own accord. We're not going to deal with the climate crisis unless we make conscious decisions to deal with the crime crisis and to work on it together at various levels. 
Iceland's scenery is stunning, and increasingly visitors are arriving again from around the world to see it. But Reid says people in her adoptive country know that natural beauty is at risk and that Iceland has solutions to help preserve it. Chris Brown, CBC News, in Reykjavik, Iceland. When we come back, a controversial new take on the people's princess. This is definitely not a, a movie that, that she would have you know, signed off or agreed with. Next, why some say this new portrayal of Diana is cruel. I'm Jamie Poisson. Join me for CBC's daily news podcast, Front Burner. Every weekday, Front Burner takes you deep into the story shaping Canada and the world. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. 24 years after her death, Princess Diana remains popular. Her life story so appealing to Hollywood producers. But some Diana fans take issue with the new film, Spencer, for how it portrays her flaws. As Tessa Arcilia shows us, the movie's star, Kristen Stewart, thinks that only makes Diana more real. Is she here yet? In the highly regimented world she married into. So stand very still and smile a lot. Diana, Princess of Wales, was anything but. The new movie, Spencer, in reference to Diana's maiden name, sees actress Kristen Stewart portraying the darker, more unflattering side of the people's princess. How much liberty did you take? We took all of the liberties. We really had this beautiful terrain in which to dance and dream and sort of revive this woman. It was fun to be able to pull back the curtain and sort of dream about what it must have been like. A bold take by Chilean director Pablo Larraín. Mommy, what happened to make you so sad? Spencer takes place over a three-day Christmas holiday in 1991 at the royal family Sandringham estate. Three days, that's it. Self-built as a fable from a true tragedy rather than an accurate account, Stuart's Diana is in an almost constant state of near hysteria. I think it's really important to show multidimensional, multifaceted, flawed uh, women on screen because that's true. A woman in a failing marriage, struggling with bulimia, depression, self-harm, and a desperate desire to break free I from the change. rules. You have to be able to do things you hate. You hate. There has to be two of you. Personal branding consultant Diana Young, who shares a birthday with the Princess of Wales and was named after her, says this portrayal will resonate with a lot of women. Seeing somebody behind, you know, this public figure, you know, Queen of Hearts, Princess Diana, going through what many women may potentially be going through today, it just, you know, it kind of makes her feel a little bit more human. But a human depiction that some royal watchers have dubbed cruel and unnecessary. Had she have been alive, this is definitely not a, a movie that, that she would have, you know, signed off or agreed with. That may be so, but Stewart says her portrayal was a personal exploration. That's the whole reason we made the movie, because of this sort of deep curiosity about this whole entity. The royal family, what happened with her. In Spencer, we see the latest interpretation of Diana, an enduring enigma even more than two decades after her death. Tessa Arcilia, CBC News, London. Coming up, a salon owner is saying no to talking COVID and yes to speaking kindly. The outpouring of love was amazing. Makes me cry every time. <laughs> Why cutting off conversation is bringing the community together in our moment. You may be used to signs saying no shoes, no shirt, no service, but how about no COVID talk? At a salon in Saskatchewan, that is the number one rule. And the response has been overwhelming. The inspiration and the impact on the community in Weyburn is our moment. A space free of the following topics. There's no COVID, there's no vaccination discussion, and there's no political discussion. So be kind, that's all we ask. I have put them up every single place in the salon, from the front door to the back door, to every single station, every room that we have here, including on the back of the bathroom door. They are posted everywhere. I felt there was negativity always around us, so I needed to change. 
the first day when I did put it up, um, I was pretty nervous. The outpouring of love was amazing. Makes me cry every time. <laughs> people that were clients and people that weren't clients stopped by. They dropped off treats and hugs and gifts and some of them cried. Some of them laughed with, with excitement and just pure happiness. It's been heartwarming to see that my community come together and pull each other up. It's been truly a blessing. So interesting on so many levels. It clearly tells us something about what was going on, at least in that community and in that salon before the sign got put up. We're kind of used to the unwritten rules, don't talk about politics, don't talk about religion, but kind of like debate, but I like civility as well. So I guess I'm for that. Um, that is The National for October 29th. Join me Sunday for Cross Country Checkup on CBC Radio 1 and later Sunday night right here for The National. Good night.